Hello, I'm glad you're able to watch this message. It'd be great if you could visit sometime, but if not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area. Hope to see you sometime. Lord, thank you. You're good to us. We're grateful that we can spend this short time together with you. I thank you that uh, this first part of the week, we can just uh, look to you in a special way and just tell you that you're the most important thing in our life. We couldn't imagine not knowing you. The true living God, the one who made us and brought this time and space into existence. Uh, we understand you have great power. And we also know that you have loved us in an incredibly great way. Jesus, thank you that you stepped out of heaven and added a sinful nat uh, a human nature to your divine nature, Lord. That you could take uh, our place in the judgment that we deserve. We're grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you that the grave couldn't hold you, that you came out alive and you ascended into heaven. And now you wait a time to return. And we look forward to it, Lord. I, I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing you close human history the way it should be. And Spirit of God, we're grateful that you live in those of us who have put our faith in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you that you live among us as a community of believers that you're the one who, who turns us from those things that are false and unholy towards those things that are true and right. Thank you that you've inspired words for us to trust instead of our own feelings. We can depend on these, these words that you've uh, inspired for us to follow. And even today, as we take a closer look at some of these, help us to understand them. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there was a, a guy who was praying in the morning, the story I heard, and he said, Lord, if you want me to share Jesus with someone today, he said, please give me a sign and show me who it is. Just give me a sign. And so he was heading to work. He got on a bus, and uh, the bus was relatively empty, but this huge individual stepped on and, and sat down next to him uh, in the bus seat. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, looking at his stuff as he's going to work. And finally, the guy next to him just starts shaking a little bit. And he starts weeping. And he said, my life is a mess. And he said it out loud in front of everybody. My life is a mess. He said, I, I know that God is not involved in my life at all. And he said, I need him in my life. And then he turned to the guy next to him. And he said, can you help me understand how I can connect with God? And the man that had prayed earlier that morning just kind of bowed in prayer again. He said, Lord, is, is this the sign that you, uh, you have delivered to me? You know? Let me ask you this. How hard is it for you to share with somebody else a uh, perspective of God that they need to hear about your faith in Jesus? How hard is that for us to do that? Um, preparing <clears throat> his, uh, this book, uh, Leighton Ford years ago wrote a book, and he uh, he said, in preparing for this book, I've talked to a lot of people, and the fear issue comes up front again and again. And then he says, what makes people hesitate to share their faith? Here are some fears that have been mentioned to me. And then he lists some uh, through the years that he's, he's heard from people, and I've heard these, and I've lived these, and you might have too. I'm afraid I might do more harm than good is one of the fears. I don't know what to say, is another one. I may not be able to give snappy answers to tricky questions, that's another one. I may invade someone's privacy, another one is I'm afraid I might fail, and then the last one he mentioned was I'm afraid I might be a hypocrite, you know, and so uh, he said one, one question was asked on a survey, what is your greatest hindrances hindrance to sharing Jesus with somebody else, to believers, asked this question. And he said 51% said that their biggest problem was the fear of how the other person would respond to them. And he said none of us like to be rejected, ridiculed, or regarded as an oddball, right? I mean, let me ask this question of all of us. Are we afraid to identify ourselves with Jesus uh, 
with somebody else. And I bet if I ask how many of you have just clammed up at some point where you thought, man, this would be a great opportunity to talk about him, all of us would raise our hands, I'm sure. You know. Uh, are we afraid, though, deep down to tell someone the good news? You know, uh, my dad, I shared this years ago, but I was in the middle of my engineering program. My dad really didn't care whether or not I went into engineering or not. He wanted me to probably come alongside of him and, and drive one of his trucks for him. But uh, he came to me one time, probably at my mom's urging, as I'm heading back off to school, because I've been talking about, you know, man, I'm, I want to go into ministry. You know, I want some, something God's calling me to here. You know, I want to I live my life for Jesus, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, the kind of stuff that starts to scare a parent who has a certain view of how their kid should live their life, right? And uh, he came to me and he said, he said, I mean, just, he said, son, I just need to tell you something. He said, don't be a fanatic, he said. You got to live in the real world, okay? That's what he said to me. And I loved him for that. I mean, he cared about me as a parent. He wanted to make sure that, you know, my life was going to turn out well. And he knew that fanatics' lives don't turn out well, is uh, kind of in his worldview. And, uh, you know, it's okay to believe in Jesus and all that stuff. Maybe have him come alongside of you from time to time, but don't let it consume your life, because that's weird. Right? That's basically how people think about it. And maybe, maybe you chafe against the idea of being a fanatic, even as a, uh, someone who identifies as a believer in Jesus. You chafe against the idea of being a fanatic, you know. But we're going to look at something that the Apostle Paul passed on to a younger pastor, something that he's going to share with him, because we know about, basically, uh, living our life uh, boundless for Christ in a certain sense. Last week, we learned that Tim uh, Timothy had a timidity problem, and the word translated is he was, he was experiencing cowardice in his life. The Apostle Paul tactfully pointed that out to him. You are timid, son. Don't be a coward. And so this week, he's going to expand on that a little bit as we take a look at verses 8 through 18 of chapter 1. Paul addresses the idea of getting uncomfortable for Jesus in this passage. And as I read through it, what I want you to do is just count how many times he uses the word ashamed in his communication. Paul said, so do not be ashamed, number one, to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed an herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Figelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. What's What's the Apostle Paul urging Timothy to do with his life? He's, he's urging him not to shrink back when it comes to Jesus. Not to shrink back. This is not a time to shrink back. And basically, what Paul is telling him is what God's telling us is that, that we need to get uncomfortable for Jesus. That needs to be our way of life. I mean, 
the first thing that we need to realize is that we have power. Look at this. Realize that you have power. Look at verse 8 as we start off here. So do not be ashamed, and he uses the word ashamed. That means to shrink back, to be embarrassed by, right? To testify about our Lord. When it comes up about mentioning God, mentioning Jesus, sometimes we go, oh, crud, what are they going to think of me? And we're embarrassed by it. We shrink back. And then he says, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. Why would you include that? Because Paul is in prison because of Jesus. His testimony, his story of Christ is what got him put into jail. And he's in jail under Nero, and this imprisonment is going to end in his death. And people know it. He suspected it. And you find that in the letter if you read it through. You go, yeah, he, he can sense that death is near. And so some of the friends that have been close to him have been pulling back now because they're thinking they're going to kill Paul because he's associated with Jesus. And if I am boldly and not ashamed Paul's friend, they're going to think that I share the same views as Paul and they're going to put me in there too and who knows what's going to happen to my life. And so people are ashamed of Paul. But it's the same as being ashamed of Jesus. Because Paul's in there because of Jesus. And so he tells Timothy, don't be ashamed. Or ashamed of me, his prisoner. And look what he says, but join with me. And the word is unique, you know. Suffer alongside. Let's suffer together, is what he's telling him. Let's suffer together for the gospel by the power of God. And the gospel simply means the, the good news about Jesus by the power of God. And so he's saying, I'm inviting you not to be ashamed, but to step forward and suffer with me. And, and uh, he says, by the power of God. We have power. Uh, you know, it's, life isn't about, and I'm going to say this right here, isn't about preserving ourselves or preserving yourself. Life is about losing yourself for Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not about preserving yourself. And you might say, I can't do it. That's not me. I'm not that person. Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, some people are more outgoing. You know, you see in the time where everyone's greeting each other, some people just say, hey, how's it going? I like kind of stuff. And other people are like, hey, how's it going? More reserved and then more outgoing people. And that's the way it comes. It is with uh, sharing uh, about uh, Christ as well. Sometimes people are more outgoing in that activity and seem to be more bold. But all of us are called to it. There's not one person who is not called to identify with Jesus and value his message enough to share it with somebody else And uh, when the time comes. And so we have power to tell somebody else. Uh, look in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said this to his followers at the time, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Spirit hadn't been given yet. Jesus hadn't ascended into heaven at this point. He's speaking to them personally. But in Acts chapter 2, if you've read through Acts, you will see that the power of God through the Holy Spirit rested upon them and he was given to the church and the followers of Jesus then personally received the Spirit of God. And he dwells among us now as a part of his community. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you possess his very presence in you. He has power. You have the ability to open your mouth. You have the ability to live a life that others look at and say, there's someone who's living differently. They smell of God. I remember, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities we have, and I was working through this. I thought of one for myself, and I'm the first one to raise my hand. Have I been uh, embarrassed or tempted to be ashamed at times and not open my mouth? Yeah, I have. There's no doubt about it. I can think of times that that has happened, but there have been other times where I just took a step and opened my mouth and said something. You know, there was a a woman who called one time on the phone uh, here years ago, and she said, is this the wrong number? And I said, well, maybe not. It depends on whether or not God's trying to tell you something. She said, what do you mean? Well, this is a church, and I'm a pastor, and it'd be great to see you in church on Sunday sometime. (laughs) Uh, You know, those conversations happen sometimes. But, uh, you know, 
maybe God's trying to tell you something. You know, sometimes there's innocuous or more bold ways that you can just open your mouth for him. But we have the power. We have the ability to do it. Number two, get the right perspective of life. If you're going to get uncomfortable for Jesus, we need to have the right perspective of life. And I'm going to say this. Uh, maybe I'll ask it. Have you, even as a believer, figured out what life is about yet? Because I think there's a lot of believers who have not figured that out. What is it about? What should I be living my life for now? You know, the uncomfortable part of life is that we're going to die one of these days. And, and people just don't think through that. Okay, so then how should I live my life in light of the fact that I could squeeze all the pleasure I can out of this life, plan my life so well where I build up some treasure and then uh, use it for the rest of my life so that I can enjoy the rest of my life and then get some kind of wasting disease, get hit by a car, have a heart attack, I'm trying to be gentle here, but no one gets out alive. Okay? No one gets out alive. And the sooner someone figures that out and then orders their life in light of that, the better. Because that has everything to do with the perspective God wants us to have of life. I mean, atheists are the people that, that say, you know, the machine shuts down at the end and then that's it. They have more faith than I do. It takes a lot of faith to believe that, that, that consciousness does not continue after death. And so... The machine shuts down, that's it. So I'm squeezing all I can out of this life. And man, if I was in that category, I would not be having any nonsensical convictions about being nice to anybody else. I really wouldn't. If I really was living out my faith as an atheist. I would just be brutalizing other people because it's all about me. Survival of the fittest, isn't it? But we like to modify that for ourselves a little bit. And we like to kind of come forward like we're nice in the process and we want to be kind to other people and all that kind of stuff. Well, what justifies that? Our faith in Christ does, if you're a believer. But really, what is the perspective we need to have? Look in verse 9 now of, of, of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He says, God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. He's trying to give Timothy a perspective. He's, he's saying, listen... There is a true living God, and what he has done is he is, and we've heard this word thrown around so much that even in a non-Christian world, it's, it's uh, made fun of, but save me. But in reality, that's what it is. You were on your way to an eternity without God, and he did something by intervening for us so that we would not spend an eternity without God, that we would spend an eternity with God. That's what's called salvation. You were rescued from an eternity without God. And when he does, in the present, right now, in this life, what he calls us to do is to live life completely different. Not consuming for ourselves anymore. We are called to be separate. And the word holy means separate. God is holy. We refer to him as holy because that's what the word means. He's different than the common. Other. And when he gets his hands on us, when we put our faith in Christ, he gets his hands on us, the Holy Spirit enters our life, he grabs us and moves us into his family, separates us from the common, and he wants us to live that way. Separating ourselves from the common way everyone else is thinking around us, inventing their own morals and all their activities are based on their own feelings, and move us into the direction of just simply relying on what he tells us to be and do, and we honor him by living a life that is more and more like him. That's what a holy life is. Okay, so he says, he saved us, called us to a holy life, not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. See, a lot of times people have this misunderstanding that somehow we need to work our way towards God. We need to start doing all the rules. We need to join some religion to make us feel like uh, God's going to accept us on the basis of these things that we're doing for him. Look, he's such a good religious person. Or look, he's, he's trying his hardest, and so come on in, in the end. That's nonsense. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And that word grace means he's given you something you do not deserve. That's what it means. Based on our behavior, based on my behavior, he's given me something I don't deserve. I don't deserve it. I can't earn my way into his presence. And so this grace, he goes on and says, was given us, 
How? What is this grace that he, that he gave us, this gift that we don't deserve? was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. And so before he made anything, the foundational, first call, the sole ultimate reality, brought everything into existence, but knowing that down through the corridor of time, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, would have to step into this world and take your place in death. He knew that before he made anything. He knew what the great cost would be. And so into the world came Jesus at just the right time. You see that in verse 10. Has been revealed, brought to light through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. What did he do? He has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel means good news. So what did he do? God added a human nature to his divine nature. Appeared among us took our place in the judgment that we deserve for our fallenness, our sin. And by the way, a good definition of sin is you saying, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. And a lot of people even want to include God in it at times like, hey, I'm doing what I want down here, Lord. If you want to come alongside of me and help me with this, thank you. I'd, I'd appreciate that. But if you really don't want to help me with what I want, you can just stay back there. I don't care. You see, that's what a sinner does. But someone who understands that they are lost without God will come to that place where they say, I need you to have mercy on me. I need you to forgive me. And that's why Jesus appeared. He took the judgment that we deserved. The Father poured out His wrath on Jesus instead of us. And Jesus came back to life by the power of God so that He could conquer death and give us life. And that's what he says here. He's destroyed death and brought life, in verse 10, uh, 10 there, and immortality to light through the gospel. Isn't that what people want? I mean, by the way, everyone wants life. That's why people are grabbing and grabbing and grabbing and grabbing down here in this world. Relationship to relationship to relationship. Stuff to stuff to stuff to stuff. Trip to trip to trip to trip. Whatever it might be. They're trying to grab life out of this world. But it all ends up in death. It's just, we're just heading towards the edge. So what's it about? True life doesn't, has nothing to do with this physical existence. True life has everything to do with God connecting with you and enabling you to live for all of eternity, starting now. That's what true life is. And that's what he's saying. People don't have life. And they can have it. We have a great message for people. And then he said, As, uh, and of this gospel, this good news, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. In other words, God grabbed a hold of me and said, I want you to proclaim this. I want you to go and lay the foundation for it. And I want you to teach it to people. And that's why he's in prison. And so he, he basically is saying here, this is what life's about, Timothy. This is what life is about. I said before, my dad mentioned the real world to me. What is the real world? I tell you what, when, when, when humanity is standing before the judgment of Christ himself, suddenly what the real world is will come crashing down on everyone. Everyone. The most significant decision anyone will ever make is what they will do with Jesus. In Luke chapter 15, we find a, a series of three wonderful stories. That, that the third one is the parable of the uh, prodigal son, if you would. But the first one here uh, is, is, starts this uh, trio of stories. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Why were they doing that? Because they want life. And they know they've failed. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. All the religious folks that wanted everyone to think that they've measured up. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. 
And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. He's relating something that everyone knows, can experience. Something valuable to you is gone. You, you stress yourself out for it. You, you look for it, and finally you find it. You go, wow, it's great. I have it now. He's putting people in the place of God here. This is exactly how God feels when someone lost is found. Look what he says. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who does not need to repent. What does a sinner need to repent? What does that mean? Someone heading in his own direction, off wandering in his own, own way of thinking and living life the way that they feel like living, might have a touch of religion here and there, but they're doing whatever they feel like doing in life, comes to their senses and says, I've been doing it wrong. I need you. I need you to forgive me. I've been doing all these things wrong. I've been heading in a direction that you don't want me to head in. I want you. That's what repentance is. And I don't care what I have to give up in the process. See, that's what, it, what repentance is. And Jesus said heaven absolutely goes crazy over that. That's the most important thing that someone can possibly do. I love this story about uh, evangelist of a previous generation a little bit before um, Billy Graham's time, D.L. Moody. Moody Bible Institute is named after him. He was approached by someone who just wanted the secret to his ability to share about Jesus in such a way that people would actually give their life to Christ. He didn't understand how that was happening. And, and he went up to Moody and he, he said, uh, help me understand this. You know? and Moody took him up to his hotel room, had a little conversation with him, took him over to the window and he said, look out the window and tell me what you see down there. He looked down and he said, well, I see lots of business, people, cars, etc. And he said, okay, why don't you go back over to the window and tell me what you see this time. Walked over to the window again, looked down, he said, well, okay, uh, men, women, children. He said, one more time, go over to that window and tell me what you see. He said, the guy got frustrated, he said, I don't know what you're getting at here. And at that point, Moody walked over to the window with tears in his eyes. And as he looked down at the street below, he said, you know what I see down there? I see people going to hell without Jesus. That's what I see. And this man wanted to learn the secret. And the secret is simply this. He knew what the real world was all about. He knew what the score was for all of eternity. It's not just about people having fun doing what they feel like doing down there because there's probably a lot of successful people walking around on that street making money, having a good time, laughing with their girlfriend or their boyfriend. But the ultimate long-term reality is if someone has not put their faith in Christ and turned away from their sin, they will spend an eternity without him. And that's the perspective of life that Paul had. And so the question would come to us when we look out our window, what do we see? What do we see? Number three, if we're going to get uncomfortable for Jesus, we need to know and trust the Lord. We need to know and trust the Lord. Look at verse 12. That is why I'm suffering as I am. What's the reason he's suffering? Because I see the world this way, and I can't stop talking about Jesus. That's why I'm suffering. And then he says, yet I'm not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed. I don't recoil and get all embarrassed about it. Why? Because I know whom I've believed. I put my faith in. That he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. Everything that someone does in the name of Christ to advance his cause on the earth somehow, he never forgets, ever. People will let you down, but God will never let us down. He will remember us. Paul says he's not ashamed because God's opinion of him is much more important than anyone else's opinion in this world. I was reminded as I was preparing this message, anyone ever heard of Hurricane Harbor in, in Texas, near Dallas out there, Dallas-Fort Worth area? We lived out there, and we would drive two hours to go to that huge water park with the girls. They were just little ones at the time, <laughs> running around. And uh, 
And, you know, you could find all kinds of environments in that place. And we were spending our time where the little kids were, you know, in the, the pirate area. And there was waters and, and a big bucket of water dumped on people. And a big rock there with about a foot and a half of water below it. And, uh, you know, it was all soft material. So Hannah was scurrying up that rock. And uh, Leslie was standing in front of her, you know, just jump, Hannah. You know, jump. Hannah would jump into her arms and she'd scurry back up there like a little squirrel and come jumping out again and Leslie would grab her and eh, this happened over and over and over again and Leslie got distracted one time as Hannah scurried up there and turned and all of a sudden she heard a <laughs> turned around and there was Hannah just spread out face down in about a foot of water because she had jumped and Leslie hadn't caught her okay you can think what that is and I'm going to say this every human being on the face of this planet will let you down everyone all of us have a story to tell of how we've trusted somebody and they haven't come through for us we've entrusted information to them possibly and they have betrayed us everyone has a story like that but that will never happen with the living God ever you can do what he's called you to do down here and he will remember and gladly welcome you not because you've earned your salvation but because you've trusted him as this life has unfolded you know uh, I think a lot of times the reason we choose not to sacrifice for him is because sometimes we don't know him well enough to express what Paul did how do we get to know him better how do we how do we gain more confidence that God has our backs no matter what and he will remember everything we entrust to him? You know, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 is just one that came to my mind. You might have memorized it at some point. If you haven't, it's a wonderful verse to memorize. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Very simple way about how we should live our life. We have all kinds of understanding about how we need to be living our life, how we should be conducting ourselves in this world, the moral principles that we might want to think would work best, and there are certain things that work better for us than others. And sometimes those directly contradict what God says in His Word. The question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to trust what He said, or are we just going to do things our own way? And the way that we get to know Him better is by saying, I'm not going to live by my feelings or how everyone else is doing things in this world. I'm going to do what you've told me to do. I'm going to put my confidence in you. I'm going to choose the way you call me to live. And the more you do that, the more your confidence in God grows. You know, there's things that I could mention here today that would help you get to know God better, like consistent prayer talking to him on a regular basis, a conversation with him, pouring out your life to him, asking him for certain things, also studying his word as you look through uh, the scriptures and you, you find those things that he wants, your knowledge of his will expands and you're able to obey him in certain ways that you haven't before and fellowship is extremely important where you're around other people who, who are in it with you. It's extremely important. You don't surround yourself with people thinking absolutely opposite of the way God wants you to think and, and think that you're going to get to know God better. It's good to be around people like that, but if, only if you have a core group of people that you hang around with who do agree with every good thing that God wants for us. That way, when we interact with other people, they see a difference in our lives, and we're not trying to be more like them. See, There's ways that we get to know God better. Number four, if we're going to get uncomfortable for Jesus, see the gospel as a trust. Interesting little phrase. And here's what I mean. Uh, my dad used to take a break sometimes uh, when he'd come home from work or on a weekend. He'd be sitting in his chair reading or just uh, relaxing a little bit. My mom would say, you want a cup of coffee? Ready? Yes, Marie, please. And so she'd make it just the way my dad would want and bring it over to him, thank you, Marie, and that would be it. One time my mom said, why don't you take the coffee over to your dad? I said, okay. And so I fixed it up, and my mom wasn't looking, and I 
I thought, I wonder if my dad would notice if I poured a bunch of salt in his coffee. <laughs> Here you go, Dad. And, you know, he took it, took a sip, and he said, thank you, son. That's when I should have kept my mouth shut, but I didn't. I said, Dad, I put salt in your coffee, and you didn't even notice. I'm telling you, I'll never forget the look on his face. He just turned to me, and he just gave me that look like, man, I trusted you, son. I mean, and, I, and here's what I get, you know? And I'm like, oh, crud, you know? And, 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 you know, God has done that. Do you handle carefully the things that have been trusted to you in your life? How do you do that? That was a trust my dad had in me, and I, and I violated his trust. There is a trust that has been given to us. Look at 2 Timothy 1.13 now. What you heard from me, Paul says, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. In other words, as an apostle, I'm laying a foundation for everything that we should rest on. Keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit. Look what he says. That was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. What's he telling us? A message has been delivered to us as believers. One, if you're a believer in Christ, that you have received. You have put your faith in. You have said, I trust what you've done to pay for my sin, and I can't wait to see you one of these days. And that message has come to you, and you responded to it. Guess what? Now you've been entrusted with it to share that with other people. And here's what happens sometimes. We're tempted to water it down. We're tempted to diminish the impact some ways. Why don't we like to talk about hell with people? Maybe we like to water that down. There's not really a hell. Well, you would never understand the love of God if there wasn't a hell. If there was an ultimate justice in the universe, you would have no message to share of God's love for us. Because he did something in direct response to that to rescue us. And sometimes we like to water it down uh, by, by saying, you know what, you don't have to uh, it, it just depend on Jesus. You can do some good things that will earn his favor. So if you're basically a good person, he's going to accept you one of these days. You have just blown the gospel in the head. Because if people can just be good enough where God will overlook a whole bunch of stuff and bring you into heaven, there's no gospel. There's no good news. We've blown the trust that God has given us with it. If someone wants to come to you and say that there's more than one way to get to heaven, it's not just through Jesus, though Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Everything that Jesus communicated about himself was that he's God in human flesh, and the only way to heaven was to trust him. No, we might say, hey, I don't care what your religion is or what your belief is. He's going to take that all into account. Well, you've just shot Jesus in the head. You have no gospel. You have no good news. See? See? I could go on with that list, right? But he's saying, listen, this has been entrusted to you, believer. Are you going to mess with it or are you just going to pass it on? Because you're embarrassed, you're going to mess with it? No, you just pass it on as was given to you. And that's what believers in Jesus have been doing ever since. Number five and the final thing I want to say is simply this. If you're going to get uncomfortable for Jesus, fellowship is important. And that's one of those Christianese words sometimes you go, oh, fellowship. But it literally means, in the original language, koinonia, it means to share in common. We all have fellowship in this world over certain things. You know, there's baseball fellowship, there's football fellowships, there's, uh, you know, you name it. Some people share it in common and think it's very valuable to hang out with other people who share that in common, no matter what it is. But there's one fellowship that trumps any other fellowship. That's the fellowship of believers in Christ. That fellowship must be in place. And if you've been around long enough, you find lots of reasons why people don't engage in that kind of fellowship. Why? Because usually it's because there's other fellowships out there that are more important to them. Oh, well, I got this going on, or I have that going on, or this thing's going on. I don't have time for that. Well, that means that you don't value the fellowship around Christ as the most important thing in this world. It doesn't trump any other fellowship. Other fellowships trump Jesus. 
And there's encouragement when there's a sense that you're in it with the cause of Christ's heart and soul. Look at verse 15 through 18 as we close this. He says, you know, because he brings it down to a personal level now, that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. Great names for your kids, by the way, if you're thinking about it. I ain't got a name a kid, right? And so he's saying, look, these guys were with me in the message, but now that I'm in prison... Now that I'm about ready to pay with my life, they don't want to be around anymore. They're not in it with me. They're not heart and soul around the message anymore. Because they're thinking Paul's going to lose his life. They're going to know that I'm in it with Jesus. I'm, I'm in Jesus with Paul, and they're going to start coming after me. That's why people were deserting him. And they were leaving him. But he says, on the contrary. He said, may the Lord show mercy, in verse 16, to the household of Onesiphorus. There's a better name for your kids. Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. See, he's showing a contrast. This man knew what fellowship was about to the very end. He knew what it was about. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. He wasn't ready to make any excuse. Well, I guess I didn't see Paul. Where is he? I gotta get with him. I gotta pray with him. I gotta encourage him. We're in it together. See, that's the kind of thing. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. There's an encouragement when there's a sense that others are in it with you for the ultimate reason to live. You see? And so, you know, uh, I guess the message is getting uncomfortable. For for Jesus today and these are ways that we need to think in order to uh, process that better uh, I'll just close with this I remember I was involved with a college group of Christians and we would go I've shared with you before to different uh, spring break venues uh, where people are just partying and you know, get going crazy and we would go and we would hopefully establish some rapport with folks and share with them the ultimate reason to live and we would do that in creative ways, and some of those would be public. And man, it would just make you uncomfortable, right? You're out on the beach, and uh, you know one of the games was uh, you'd put someone on your shoulders, usually a guy with a, a girl on his shoulders, and you'd tape an egg to your forehead. The girl would have a rolled up piece of newspaper, and you would be in an arena, a circle, with a whole bunch of other people, and all the girls were trying to whack the guy's forehead to break the egg. And the one that survived without the egg broken were the victors. I'm going, why am I sharing this with you? Because right after those events, and I can name you several of them, someone would stand up and say, these folks are just happening because a crowd would gather around there. Big crowd of people. And uh, someone would stand up and say, these folks are here. Uh, they're Christians, and they'd, they'd love to share with you what changed their life. You know, And at that point, everyone would go, Phew! Except for a few people that you might grab by the hair and say, come on back here, sir. And so in those uh, venues, I'm just going to tell you right now, that's scary. You know, being that bold in public, being that bold. And there were some people that actually responded to the message that way. Another way is you just make some friends along life's way. And just, quite frankly, not be afraid to share about your faith with them. In fact, make it an intention to do that. Pray for them. Um, establish rapport with them. Let them know what you're all about. What your worldview is. Have conversations about it as you boldly bring it up at times. It's more scary to bring it up in a context of a relationship than it is just with some unknown person out there. And so... I just want to just encourage you today, if you're a believer in Jesus, get uncomfortable for him. Just get uncomfortable for him. That's what life is about. Lord, we come to you. We're grateful that we can know you, the true living God, and that you've offered life to us, immortality. That we can live. And we can share that message with other people, Lord. Thank you that, that we can do that. You've entrusted us with that. And I ask for every, everyone here who loves you with all their heart today that they would continue to be 
uh, uh, bold and, and, and uh, uh, care uh, enough about others around them to to want to share what you've done for them. And, and for those who are believers here today who, who have who've just kind of wandered away for whatever reason, haven't made you a priority in their life, they're not thinking the way that you want them to about, about life, I ask that you would do a work deep and lasting in their life that would return them, align them with you, and energize them to continue to trust you and walk closely with you. And Father, I pray for anyone who's, who's not a believer yet. They might be involved in a church or, or uh, some kind of religious activity at some point, but they really haven't heard the true message of what you've done for them and responded to it. I ask that you do a work in their life that would change them. They would embrace Jesus and love him. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment, just for prayer, and your eyes closed. And, uh, you know, if you love him with all your heart, tell him why. Maybe there's something on your mind right now that you're thinking, this is awesome, God, and just talk to him about it. Maybe you're a believer who has wandered. You've been involved in something you shouldn't. You just know that he's not a priority in your life. This would be a great time to talk to him about that. Just tell him, Lord, I don't know what happened, but I'm sorry. I want you front and center in my life. Maybe you don't know him, and you're convinced of that right now. And this might be a great opportunity for you just to tell him, I want you in my life. I want you to change me. I, I thank you for giving me life and taking the judgment. You might not even know what to say. I'm going to pray a simple, short prayer that if you're going, that's exactly what I want to say to God, just go ahead and use this prayer as you talk to him right now in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I've done a lot of things that you hate. And I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I trust what you did for me. I know you're alive. Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus. Amen.